turn it over to you, Tim. Hello, everyone. My name is Tim DePak, and I'm from Windsor & Newton. I'll be your moderator of today's class. I would like to welcome all you to today's class, which is the Windsor & Newton Feathers Wall Art. This is the first class in our Birds of a Feather series of classes, which will be running every Tuesday at 1 p.m. Central Time throughout the month of April. I'm being joined by Mandy Peltier, who, will walk you, who is your artist instructor for today's class, as well as the rest of the classes for this series. And Mandy will be taking you to today's class by providing information about the products being used and showing you how to perform some of her favorite watercolor painting techniques, all while creating these large and brilliantly colored feathers using the Windsor Newton Cotton Watercolor Sketcher box set. She'll also show you some of her completed pieces for the upcoming classes in the series. I'll put the links for those classes in the chat on the side in case you'd like to book those if you haven't done so already. And also there was a sketch outline for this class that was provided for you. If you haven't gotten that yet, we can also put that link in the chat for you as well. Upon completion of the class, you'll be sent a survey in your email. Please let us know what you think of this class, how we did, and if there's any particular topics you'd like to see Mandy perform in the future. The class replay for this will be available in 24 hours on michaels.com and Michael's Replay on the YouTube channel. We can share that link for you as well in the chat throughout the class. Please feel free to paint along with Mandy or sit back and relax and enjoy the class. And with that, I'd like to pass it over to Mandy. Thanks, Tim. Hi, everyone. Uh, it's only been a few weeks, but it feels like it's been a lot longer since I've seen you all. I took the whole month of March off and really enjoyed just being able to get some things done around our garden and our house and things like that. And it was fun to kind of scroll through and see everyone's little art space as Tim and Felicia were talking and getting set up. So it's fun to be back. It feels like it's been a while. So I'm a little nervous today because if any of you were in my Eastern Bluebird class last year, a storm came through and knocked out my internet. There's another storm going on right now. So I haven't lost power. It's been going on since like eight this morning. So hopefully we'll be able to get through the hour. I know, and it's gonna storm tomorrow too. So <laughs> I, I tell you, April and Georgia. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my other camera so we can just get going on this. All right, so like Tim said, this is the first of a four part series, Birds of a Feather, and we'll be painting these feathers today. So this is a wild turkey feather. This is sort of a loose take on a hawk feather. And this is a scarlet ibis feather, just in case you were wondering what all the feathers are. So they're not all here in North America, but they, I thought they all went kind of nice together. And it'll show you some different ways you can paint feathers. So supplies really quick. I'm using the Skechers Pocket Set. I have a glass of water. I have an artist palette. We'll be mixing seven colors today. today. I have a number four brush. I have two here because I'm just going to use an older one to mix my paint colors. And then I have a pencil and eraser for sketching the outline. And I have a paper towel for blotting. And I'm using 100% cotton, 140 pound professional cold press watercolor paper. That is a mouthful. Windsor Newton brand, of course. So uh, with that, we'll start by drawing our outline. So I will move this uh, finished example aside and bring over a copy of the outline you were provided with when you signed up for this class. And so the approach I'm going to take in drawing these feathers is I'm going to start by drawing three lines that are about the length of the feather. I'll do the first one right in the center because then it'll be easier to evenly space out the other two lines. So. I'm going to draw one line just right through the center of my paper. And then I'll draw two more on each side of it with similar or equal spacing, if you will. Again, I'm just trying to get it so it's about the length of the feathers. All right. And now what I'm going to do is you could just dive in and just draw the feathers as you see them, or you can do the tip that I like to share where you just draw the basic shape of what you see first, and then you sort of mold it as if you were working with clay to form it into the actual object you're trying to draw. So I'm going to draw teardrop shapes. So for this far left feather here, I'll just sort of start at the top and draw, or you could even call it like a leaf shape. They'll kind of look like big leaves. And then I'll do the same thing with the hawk feather. Now the hawk feather is upside down compared to the other two, or maybe the other two are upside down and the hawk feather isn't. But just for some movement, I have them going in different directions here. All right. So I have my teardrop shapes, and now I can sort of carve these curved lines to look more like the feathers. So I'll just start with the left and work towards the right. And I'm just going to sort of copy what I see. And it's okay if your feathers don't look exactly like the outline, they're still gonna look like feathers, I'm sure of it. And you can always use your eraser if you wanna make a correction here or there. All right, 
works. And the line that runs through the feather is the shaft. So you're going to hear me refer to that as the shaft quite a bit. And then the part that is just underneath the feather is the quill. So I'll be using the, the terms quill and shaft a lot. So quill is the bottom part, the shaft runs through the feather. And I am gonna try and line up the tops of the feathers and the bottom of the feathers, uh, cause that will uh, make it look nice and even on the paper. And I'm working on the hawk feather now. I'm gonna try to line up the point of the hawk feather with the quill of that first feather I drew. And now I will work on the shaft of this hawk feather. It's kind of a curvy shaft. Try to fix that up just a little bit. Okay. And then scarlet ibis, last but not least, a beautiful bird. And I think the scarlet ibis is more of, is probably the loosest feather. I mean, they're all kind of loose, but I think the scarlet ibis in particular, it's going to be what I like to call scribble scrabble <laughs> with your strokes. The looser, the better. All right. And I'm working on the quill now for the scarlet ibis. I'm going to make sure it's lined up with those other two. All right. And then you can always erase your extra lines either now or when you're done painting, but there's my drawing. And I'll hold this up so you can see. I know, like, I can see it so clear on my camera, but I know on Zoom it doesn't pick up as well on your side. So I'll try to remember to hold things up a little. And I will say with my next uh, three classes, I would strongly recommend if you have the time to draw the outline before class, because I'll have to get through the drawing portions pretty quick in order to get through the painting stuff in time. So I'm going to actually set this aside too, because we're going to mix our paint colors now. So I'm going to pull down my artist palette, my sketches pocket set, my water my number four brush. All right, first thing I'm gonna do is I'm going to place my brush in the water and just swoosh it around to help those bristles evenly absorb the water. And then I'm going to use my number four brush as if it were a spoon. And I'm going to place three scoops of water into each well on my palette. I'm gonna do it like this. I'm just gonna scoop my brush up out of the water and just sort of drop it up and down over the well. And that'll be one drop. I mean, a couple of drops may drop from your brush, but I'm going to repeat that process of taking my brush in the water, scooping it out, and then sort of flicking or dropping it up and down three times into each well. And this should allow us to have approximately the same amount of water in our palette so you can more easily at home duplicate what I'm doing over the camera and help us all achieve paint with the same or approximate paint to water ratio. I think I have one more here. And you know, if you accidentally put four drops in, that's okay, or even two drops, you may just have to mix a little bit more paint as we work together today. Okay, so the first color I wanna mix is black because we're going to use the black paint we mix to mix gray. So there's a few different ways you can mix black using this set. I'm going to mix black today using ultramarine blue, which is second from the right on the top row. And then the color that's right below ultramarine blue, burnt umber. So burnt umber is a brown and brown is created by mixing the three primary colors together. You can also mix black by mixing the three primary colors together, but usually at least with this set and usually when I'm mixing paint, I need more blue than I need red or yellow. So by mixing the ultramarine blue and the burnt umber, we're sort of doing a shortcut where we only have to use two colors instead of the three primaries. So I'm going to start by doing four passes of ultramarine blue. When I say pass, I'm going to take my wet brush. I'm just going to run it into that half pan a handful of times or for a couple of seconds. I'm going to stir it into the first well in my palette with water. And I'm going to wipe my brush just once on each side to release excess water. That's one pass. That was sort of slow motion. I do it pretty quick. I'm going to do it three more times with ultramarine blue. Just one and then two. So you can see how I'm just doing it pretty quick. It doesn't need to be a, a slow thing. And then once you have uh, four passes of ultramarine blue, I'm going to add enough burnt umber to that to get black. So the first pass of burnt umber is going to turn the blue into a darker blue. And then it will look kind of navy. And then it might look midnight blue. And then it should eventually reach black. 
If it actually looks too brown, like a really deep dark brown, you'll need to add a little bit more um, ultramarine blue to it. So it might be a bit of a back and forth game to reach black and that's okay. Uh, you will eventually get there by mixing these two colors together. I just find it takes a little bit more blue than it does brown. And then when you're done mixing black, don't rinse your brush. It's okay if you did already, but if you haven't, don't rinse your brush, just stir it into the next well in your palette. Because like I said, we're going to mix gray using the black we just mixed together. And after I wipe my brush several times on the rim of the second well where I stirred in my brush, I'm going to actually put it back into the black and stir it around and then stir that into the second well as well uh, so that I can use that to make gray. And then to make gray out of this, you could technically use it like it is now because it's sort of a wash of black but I like for all my paint colors to have an equal paint to water ratio. So I'm going to add three passes of white to this wash of black that we have right now. And those three passes of white will uh, give us a gray that has the same paint to water ratio as black. And I do have to be honest with you, I'll probably need to mix more black for this particular class. So to give you guys just a moment to catch up here, I'm gonna go ahead and mix more black now. So if I'm moving a little faster with these two colors, you have a second to catch up here. So I'm just going to mix a little bit more black into that first well by just doing uh, the ultramarine blue and burnt umber combo. And then the gray was just a couple stirs of the brush into the black and uh, some ultramarine, or not ultramarine, sorry, uh, Chinese white, which is the only white in your set. All right. And I may go ahead and make my gray more of a middle value gray. There we go, it's pretty. All right, so we have black and we have gray. So the next three colors, I'll give you a little bit of a break. We're just going to use one color <laughs> for each of the next three colors. So the next color we're going to mix is burnt sienna, which is the reddish brown in your set. It's only burnt sienna. So just do six or so passes of burnt sienna into the next well on your palette here. until you have what feels like the same paint to water ratio as what we did for the black and the gray. This does take practice, so uh, please don't get discouraged if you're struggling mixing colors right. It takes practice. All right, so we have burnt sienna. The next well is going to just be yellow ochre. Yellow ochre is sort of the darker yellow that's on the bottom row. It's just to the left of burnt sienna. I think it sort of looks like a mustard yellow, which is one of my favorite colors. I find that I'm really drawn to mustard yellow for some reason in my clothing and my design choices. Really like this color. All right. And then the next color is going to be burnt umber. That is the brown we use to mix, mix the black and the gray. So just do burnt umber on its own for the next well in your palette. Six passes or so. And then we're going to mix two reds to finish up our palette today. So the first color I'll have us mix is a red orange. So for the red orange, we're going to do an equal number of passes of alizarin crimson, which is your red, and cadmium red pale hue, which is your orange, both on the top row, both right next to each other. So I'm going to do three passes of each. Now you can see from my palette, a couple of my colors probably should be replaced. I didn't do that before class today because I, this may look just like your palette, right? So you may have to move your brush sort of around the sides in order to pick up that color. But you can really use these wells until they're, um, or these half pans until they're done. All right, so mixing equal parts, cadmium red pale hue and alizarin crimson will get us a bright um, red orange color, which is really pretty. And then go ahead and um, once again, don't rinse your brush, just go ahead and stir it into that next well on your palette. I mean, we might as well, because we're going to mix a dark red next. And to mix the dark red, I'm going to do three passes of alizarin crimson, just as we started off with for the red orange, three passes of alizarin crimson. 
I'm only going to do one pass this time of cadmium red pale hue. And I'll explain why we're doing that in a second. And then to darken this today, um, you might think we're going to use more umber. We're actually going to use a cerulean blue hue, which is the blue on the top row far right. And the reason is, um, you know, red and blue make purple, correct? Uh, the two primary colors will make the secondary of purple. But when you mix opposites on the color wheel, they de-intensify each other. And we added orange in there. Well, orange and blue are opposites on the color wheel. So having that influence of orange in here will give us a darker maroon red versus purple. It's that influence of orange. So I just want sort of a dark kind of burgundy red. And we did that by mixing three parts lizard crimson, one part cadmium red pale hue. And then I probably did two or three passes of the cerulean blue hue. I just kept adding it until it was um, as dark as I would like. I'm gonna add just a touch of red to my red orange. It looks a little on the orange side here. All as right. Mandy mixing all those paints, I wanna say, it's amazing the colors that Mandy creates by just using the sketcher box set that she has in front of her there, that the colors are endless. They really are. <laughs> Um, I don't know what number of class this is, but I have a few classes too that break down color theory a little bit more specifically. So you can always go back through and watch my other classes. You can find them all on my website, mandypeltier.com um, and watch the replays of those. Okay, so we are ready to get going. I'm going to shift things around here. So the first layer of each feather is probably the longest. So if you're looking at the time after the first layer and you're like, I don't know if Mandy's gonna be able to do this in an hour. Um, the second layer goes a little bit faster than the first, and the third layer is really quick. So we're going to do three layers to each feather, but we're going to do one layer at a time to each feather, and then go back and do the second, and then go back and do the third. So that's sort of the progress we're going to make today. I'm going to start with the wild turkey feather, um, and the first layer of the wild turkey feather only uses gray. So that's the good news here, is you only have to use one color to start to kind of ease us into this. I don't know about you, but I really like to ease into things. My husband makes fun of me for it often. Um, so we're going to use gray to start, and I'll kind of talk you through the process of what we're going to do. So we're going to work uh, one half of the feather at a time, and I'm going to begin by applying a line of gray, just pure gray paint, along the left of the quill and the shaft on the feather itself. So just along the left side of that shaft, I'm gonna draw or paint on a, uh, a line of gray. And then we're going to do what I've done in a lot of my classes where I'll place the brush in my water for just a second. And then I'll apply a now diluted version of that gray to the rest of the left half of the feather. And it will create a bit of a gradient where it's darker along the shaft and then lighter as we reach the tips of the feather. So that's what we're going to do. Um, and then after we do that, we're gonna do one other thing to add a little bit of texture and then we'll mirror that on the right side. All right, so I'm gonna put some gray on my brush. If your colors start to separate a little in your well, just give it a stir with your brush, it's no big deal. And I'm just going to paint a line along the left of the shaft. I'm gonna try and leave a very thin gap uh, for the shaft where there's no paint, some negative space. Uh, that really won't be important until we start working on the right side here or we'll wanna be careful to just leave a little gap. I mean, if you cover the shaft, it's no big deal. You can use this one as your practice piece. All right, and then after you have your pure line of gray along the left of the shaft, place your brush in the water for just a second, and I'm gonna start painting it just along where I applied that pure version of gray so that they can sort of bleed and merge into each other. And I'll place my brush into um, the water as often as I need to in order to um, have water to kind of move around with. I don't want my paper to be soaking wet or anything, but I do need enough that I can uh, do this gradient technique. I'm just filling that in to the whole left side of the feather. So you can see, I'll hold this up. You can see how it's darker towards the shaft and gets lighter towards the edges. And then while this is all still wet, I'm going to add a little bit of texture. I'm just gonna take a clean brush, even one that I have blotted on my paper towel lots of times. And I'm going to um, apply several angled hatching strokes all along the left side of the feather. I'm gonna start at the pure line of gray or what's left of it. And I'm just gonna sort of flick with my brush outward, hatching strokes to uh, create some texture. And if you need to add a little bit more gray to that line so you have something to work with, that's, that's totally acceptable and okay. 
Um, this is just sort of the underpainting for this wild turkey feather and we definitely need some gray as part of the underpainting because the only other thing we're going to do to this feather is essentially the black stripes. But by doing that hatching stroke, you can see how it adds a little bit of texture and already sort of looks like a feather. And you can do that as much as you want to sort of just add this texture. It's kind of fun. All right, and then we're going to mirror this process on the right side. So I'm gonna put more gray on my brush. I'm going to go along the right of the shaft. I'm gonna try and leave a really thin line of just paper to serve as the shaft. Just do the best you can leaving that thin line. And then after that thin line of gray paint, we'll place our brush in the water for a second, add that diluted version to the right half. Maybe put a little bit too much water in my brush there. Create that gradient. And then we'll do those angled hatching strokes. And uh, what we're doing to this feather will sort of repeat in a few other spots to other feathers. So this is kind of good starting practice for us. Or this texture, if you will. Mandy, would you say as you're, as you're spreading out the paint on there, is it really absorbing in the paint the proper way there? Is, is the paper absorbing the paint? Yeah, because I, I, it looks like perfect, like the way it's, like the way you're moving, it's not, it's absorbing oh. really good. It's... Yeah, yeah, I mean, well, that's the difference, I think, between professional and student grade, is it does what you want it to do. <laughs> that's what I'm noticing as, as I yeah. see it, it's like, it's a perfect, like, right where you're stopping with the brush, the, the paint is staying right there where you want it at. Yes, yeah, I, I think that's just because it's 100% cotton paper. All right. So I'm going to, I just placed a few more of those little texture strokes, if you will. And then the last thing I want to do to this feather for this layer is just add a little bit of gray to the quill and then the shaft. So how I'm going to do that is I'm going to put just a touch of paint on the tip of my brush. And I'm going to apply a thin line along the very bottom of the quill and along the left edging of the quill. And then I'll dilute the right side by just placing my brush in the water. I'm going to wipe it several times on the rim of my glass. I didn't do that prior because uh, I don't have very much to work with here. And then I'm just going to apply that cleaned brush along the right side of the quill and I'm gonna move it up the shaft. And this will just put a light value of gray on the shaft in the right side of the quill. Like so. Oh, and I thought of one other thing I'd like to do while we're at it. So if you look at my finished piece, there's some thin, thin, wispy hairs or feathers on each side of the quill. I'm going to do that with gray. I'm just going to place the very tip of my brush into the gray, and I'm just going to apply thin, wispy lines running in all different directions to the left and right of the quill. So I can pull that up so you can see it's really light and subtle. And we'll go over it with some more colors later, but I think that's good for the first layer. All right, so next we'll work on the hawk. Now, because the wild turkey feather and the scarlet ibis were working from this direction, I think it would be hard for our brains if we tried to do the opposite for the hawk feather. At least that's how I work. <laughs> so I'm going to just turn both so that I can work on the hawk feather from the same direction as the other two. So the hawk feather is probably the most complicated one. Um, it's, it's really not complicated, but it uses more colors and more placement and more steps. So I'll tell you what to do to mimic this one, um, but it really is just supposed to be abstract and kind of loose. We're, go <clears throat> We're going to place some paint blooms on wetted paper and it's gonna be fun, but um, it may take you a, a second to kind of get the hang of it. So. Um, the first thing we're going to do is use gray. And if I were to split this feather into thirds with invisible lines, we're going to start by just working on the upper third. So we're kind of going to break this feather into thirds. So we'll start by working on the upper third, then we'll work on the middle third, and then we'll work on the bottom third. So I hope that makes sense. So we're only working on the upper third right now. And so I'm going to put some gray on my brush. And I'm going to apply that gray just along the edging on the upper third the outer edging on the upper third of the feather. So I'm just applying gray along the outer edging on the upper third of the feather. 
And I'm going to go ahead and apply very thin lines to the left and right of the shaft as well, so that I don't act accidentally paint over the shaft so that I can maintain that thin line of negative space. And just as we did with the wild turkey feather, I'm gonna place my brush in the water for just a second. And I'm going to apply a diluted version of that gray to the paper part of this section, other than to the shaft where I created that negative space. So I'm just gonna fill that in with some water to once again, create a little bit of a gradient. All right, so far it's pretty close to the wild turkey feather, right? Not too bad. You're just outlining the edging and then filling it in with water or a diluted version of the gray, really. And then just try your best to leave a very thin line for the shaft. And then we'll be ready to do the first layer for the middle third of this feather. So the middle third of this feather, I'm going to start by just applying pure water to the middle third, but I'm once again going to try and leave a thin line for the shaft. So I'll switch my brush to clean it. I'm going to start with the left and right of the shaft, and I'm just going to apply clean water along the right and the left of the shaft, and then I'll apply clean water to everything else. And it's okay if some of the gray bleeds down into this section, not a big deal. In fact, it's Good if that happens because it will just add a little more interest to your uh, your feather here. So clean water. Well, you know, the water's kind of dirty at this point because we mixed a few colors, but you know, water from your your glass there to this middle third section. All right, and then we're going to break this middle third into thirds. <laughs> so uh, we're working with thirds today. So the upper third of this middle third section. I'm going to place drops of yellow ochre um, on each side of the feather. So I'm going to put some yellow ochre on my brush and I'm just going to place drops using the tip of my brush along the upper third of both the left and right side of this feather. You don't need a lot of dots. I maybe did six or so on the left side and looks like eight or nine on the right side. I mean, I'm it's not really worth counting, just place some dots, some paint blooms, and they'll sort of bleed out into the water. And uh, you can also run this very carefully along the water lines you did on the left and right of the shaft, just to sort of mark that off. And if you want, you can also kind of do it along the edging as well, just to kind of create some clean lines. It's not, I sometimes I do that, sometimes I don't, it's not required. And then I will go ahead and clean my brush and I'll blot it. And now to the middle of this section, I'm going to use the burnt sienna and I'm gonna do the same thing. You can even overlap some of your dots over the yellow ochre. I'm not trying to cover all the white of the paper. And you can once again, sort of run it up the left and right of the shaft and along the edging for the middle part of this section. But again, I'm not trying to cover everything. You can still see some white of the paper, but as the paint blooms sort of bleed into the wet paper, they will spread out and cover most of the white of the paper, but the goal isn't to try and cover it all. And then the bottom third, we're gonna repeat this whole process with burnt umber, the brown. Hopefully the water hasn't dried on this yet. Oh good, it hasn't. All right, so I'm going to place that on the bottom third. Once again, you can sort of outline the left and right of the shaft and the edging. And while I have brown on my brush, I'm going to go ahead and paint on some brown along the bottom of the quill, the left edge of the quill. I'm going to sort of run it up the left side of the shaft until I reach that, uh, the brown that we just applied. And then I'll rinse my brush, wipe it lots and lots of times. You can even blot it once or twice. And then I'll run that up the right side of the quill just to sort of create a diluted version. I like to kind of try and work with what I have on my brush. And then I will use that brown to kind of paint on some of those random hairs too. You can always add more paint to your brush if you want, but I'm kind of pulling from the quill 
to have some wispy brown hairs. If you can see that on the camera again, it's really light. All right. And then for the bottom of this section, we're kind of going to repeat the top. Um, I'm going to outline the edging with gray and then fill that in with a diluted version of it. So I'm going to put more gray on my brush. I'm going to outline the edging here. I don't think I quite broke this into thirds, but that's okay. Always looks a little different each time. So outline the edging with gray and then brush in water and then just fill in what remains with that diluted version of gray. And if any brown from that last layer bleeds down into this section, that's okay. I actually like it when that happens because it kind of creates what looks a little bit like a French gray, which is a really pretty gray. If you want, you can even use some of that gray that's on your brush to add more wispy feathers towards the bottom if you want. And then once you've wetted the bottom section with water, I'm going to use uh, the brown again. And I'm just going to place several dots of brown all over the bottom quarter of both sides of the feather. Lots of brown dots and just let that bleed into the gray. And I'm going to go ahead and add a little bit more to the bottom edge of the quill and the left side edging of the quill too, since I have some brown on my brush. And if you want to help it transition, you can wet your brush, blot it lots of times, and just sort of use your slightly damp brush to smooth and blend. All right, so that's it for the first layer of the hot feather. So it seemed a little more complicated because we had more um, colors to use, but it'll all come together in the second and third layer. So I'm going to flip again because we're going to work on the scarlet ibis feather. Just like with the other two feathers, I'm going to start with gray on this one. And I'm just going to use the gray on the quill and the shaft. So I'm going to put just a little bit of gray on my brush. I don't have much gray left. So um, I'm going to outline the bottom edge of the quill, just like we've done. I'm going to outline the left edge of the quill, as well as the left edge of the shaft. As best you can. And then I'm place my brush in the water. I'm going to wipe it lots of times. Because I'm only diluting or smoothing the right side of the quill and shaft, and that's not very much paper, so I don't want a ton of water on my brush. And then I'm just going to run that diluted version along the right side of the quill and just sort of run it up the shaft as well. So we didn't start with um, the quill and shaft with uh, either of the other two feathers, but with this one we are. All right, so then after the quill and shaft, we are now going to pretty much repeat the process that we did on the wild turkey feather. I'm going to use the red orange color and I'm going to put some of that on my brush. We're just going to work on the left half at first and I'm going to apply a line of red orange along the left of the shaft. I'm trying to be careful not to go into that gray I painted on, but I always do and it's fine. It, this is supposed to be a somewhat looser feather. So I'm gonna apply this red orange along the left of the shaft. And then I'm just going to apply water. So I placed my brush in the water for just a second and I'm going to dilute this pure line of red orange to create a gradient. And I'm not going to try to stay within the lines as carefully on this one as I have some of the other two feathers. I'm just going to sort of scribble a little bit as I um, create this gradient. Just sort of moving my brush in sort of a back and forth manner up and down the feather to create the gradient. And then just as with the wild turkey feather, I am going to just do those slightly angled hatching strokes just to create a little bit of texture because why not? This won't be as visible as the wild turkey feather, but that's okay. All right, and then we're gonna mirror that on the right side. So pure line of red orange to the right of the quill and shaft. And then we'll just dilute it with a little bit of water. 
and do those little uh, angled hatching strokes. And this is where I kind of start to do a scribble scrabble as I sort of angle it, smooth it out and create that gradient. And then the kind of rough looking angled hatching strokes. All right, and then the, very, the last thing I wanna do on this particular step is I wanna add some yellow ochre, just a little bit of it to all of the areas on the side of the um, feather that look like a V, kind of a notch. I'm just going to um, loosely sort of paint on a little bit of ochre on those little notches. And as it sort of dries and settles into the wet paper, uh, it'll start to look a little more peachy. So we're kind of doing wet into wet here and I just added a touch of yellow ochre, just kind of moved it in a back and forth manner <clears throat> wherever there's a V shape. And that's the first layer for the Scarlet Ibis. All right, so we're doing all right here. So we'll have to be careful. I, if, I don't know if you guys are like me. I tend to rest my palm on my paper as I'm working. It doesn't matter what medium I'm working with. Um, so I'm going to try and be careful and not do that today. Uh, so, oh, I, I will say I scribbled a little bit of red orange into the shaft on my scarlet ibis feather. While it's still wet, I may just take a slightly damp brush and just sort of run that over, see if I can't smooth that out just a little. I might turn my shaft a little red orange, but that is okay. I don't really want those dry distinct lines just so you know what I'm doing and why it's because I in my scribble scrabbling I went right over the shaft there okay so back to the wild turkey feather uh, what we're going to do in this step is paint on all of these black stripes we're just going to use hatching strokes and a hatching stroke is just where you're going to lift your brush in between each stroke and I'm going to do it like this where I'm just going to do real quick hatch 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 and it's going to be with black I'm going to start at the bottom left towards the bottom and I'm just going to play small hatching strokes. I'm going to stop at the quill or shaft and then repeat on the other side. And I'm just going to work all the way up, just leaving a little space in between each stripe. And I'm going to make each stripe a little different. Some may go up and then down like little hills. Some may be straight. Each line is a little different. I'll see if I can hold that up so you can see. Each line is a little different. You're not trying to get a perfect stripe, which is why we're doing <clears throat> vertical hatching strokes versus like a horizontal straight line. We want there to be a lot of movement here. So just do lots of vertical hatching strokes. Um, don't forget about the parts that sort of protrude out from the feather. At least outline the tip on those so um, they stand out a little. And uh, try not to apply anything to the shaft itself. And it doesn't really matter how many stripes you have, just however many you can fit on. And we'll keep working our way up this feather. That feather is coming to life as you're painting those hash marks on there. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if everybody else, I'm mesmerized. I'm just watching the brush go back and forth and seeing the, the whole flower, <laughs> the, um, the feather take form right there. And you're funny. I like mesmerized right now. I'm just watching. It's like <laughs> it's, <laughs> a shadow of a feather and it's coming up there. It's perfect. There you go. Not only is painting therapeutic, but apparently watching it can be too. <laughs> All right. So remember, just leave a little bit of space for the shaft there. Easier said than done when you're in the groove. Just try your best. And when you reach the top, it's a, 
where there's not really a shaft, you can just go straight across thin and I'll apply a little bit just at the very tip. There we go. And then with the black, I'm gonna put just a touch more black on my brush and I'm going to apply it along the bottom edge of the quill, the left edge of the quill. I'm gonna just bring it all the way up the left of the shaft if I can. <clears throat> and then brush and water, wipe, kind of smooth it a little bit with your brush. And then I'm gonna use what's left on my brush to add a few more of those wispy. It's one of those things where you wanna be careful not to add too many of those wispy strokes, but they are kind of fun to paint on too. So use your piece, add as many as you think looks nice. And other than just a little bit of touch up to the uh, wild tricky feather, this one's about done. Like I said, the third step for each feather is pretty quick. Um, so since it's already 243, oh my goodness, time goes so fast, I'm gonna flip things around. We'll do the second layer to the hawk feather. So the hawk feather, I'm going to use gray. I think we're gonna have to mix just a touch more gray here. And all the times I practiced this class, I didn't have to mix more gray, I had to mix more black, so go figure. All right, so we're gonna do hatching strokes to the hawk too. Um, <clears throat> so I'm gonna hold this up. This V shape here, those are hatching strokes. This little pattern here is the hatching stroke. We're basically gonna do vertical hatching strokes along the top edging, and then just to add patterns to other parts of this feather. So all along the top quarter where we applied gray only last step, I'm just gonna sort of work along the edging and just do hatching strokes that touch the edging. And then I'm going to sort of create a V shape with my hatching strokes. I'm going to sort of go down to the shaft and then go back up. And then you can just sort of apply these hatching strokes in random other parts of the feather. Um, there's not really a right or wrong spot. I might just put a little bit here and there. I might go ahead and do the same along the bottom left and bottom right putting those hatching strokes right along the edging. Some of this is gonna get covered by some of the other colors we're adding. And some of it will just very subtly show through. We can always add more later. Um, so you don't wanna do it to the whole, whole thing, but just adding a few of these hatching strokes adds a nice touch. All right, and then we're gonna work on the middle third again. We're going to use the same three colors with the same placement as we did in the last step. So if you remember the middle third, it was yellow ochre to the top, sienna to the middle, and burnt umber to the bottom. But we are going to use a scribble scrabble. All right, so I'm going to clean and blot my brush. When I say scribble scrabble, I am not going to try and cover everything from the first layer. I'm going to put some yellow ochre on my brush, and I'm just literally going to take my brush and just sort of scribble it on and just try to be careful around the... Um, the shaft here that we need to add a little more paint to. So I'm just sort of scribbling it on to that upper third, just back and forth. You see, I'm not trying to cover everything from that first layer, but it's solid color. We're not doing water blooms this time. It's just not fully covering the water blooms. And then you can clean and blot, and it will be the same thing with the burnt sienna. You'll just sort of scribble, scrabble. You can overlap with the burnt sienna, or the ugh, yellow ochre a little. Sorry, I need to talk clearly so you guys can understand me. So. Uh, so you can scribble, scrabble the burnt sienna to the middle third. Overlap a little bit with the yellow ochre and they'll just kind of bleed and merge onto each other. And then it would be burnt umber, scribble, scrabble to the bottom third. Again, not trying to cover everything from the first layer. We'll probably cover most of it, but I guess I'm trying to say don't try to cover all of it. A little bit from the last layer peeking through looks really nice. So already you can see right here, this is looking more like this because of that second layer of color. All right, then just below where we ended with the burnt umber, I'm going to take some dark red. I'm gonna start by just placing a couple drops of dark red over the burnt umber on the right side, maybe where I put the burnt sienna on the right side, maybe up to the yellow ochre. Just a little bit, a couple drops of red, some paint blooms. 
And then I am going to place, I'm going to use sort of the side of my brush, the tip of my brush. I'm just going to kind of place some dots and texture just underneath the burnt umber on the bottom uh, quarter. Uh, you can do as ever much or as little as you want here. outline just the shaft a little and it will just sort of be distinct and kind of bleed into all the other colors. All right. So just a touch right there to the upper part of the lower quarter and then to the bottom left and bottom right I'm going to just place a little bit of brown. Sort of fill that in. I'm going to go ahead and apply that up the quill in the shaft too because I forgot to have us add something to the, the shaft so that light brown that's on the brush will look nice there up the quill and shaft. Okay. And then we are going to then add some black. The black is going to be what helps this feather start to come to life. So I'm going to hold this up so you can see. So I'm going to add black just sort of on the edging of parts of the feather using hatching strokes. Um, here, there's a larger circle. You can place it wherever you want. And I'm going to sort of dot, angle up a line, and then more over here. So for the most part, it's going to be done with, with hatching strokes. We can also use the tip of your brush and dot. So I'm going to use some black. So like up here in the upper right, I might do hatching strokes along the right side. A little bit over here on the left side. It's okay if it bleeds into any wet paint because uh, a lot of the paint will probably still be a little wet. That's okay. We can always um, add another layer in the third step where we're gonna just be sort of making final adjustments. I move over here. So kind of where I see it on the finished piece, I'll see if I can hold it up just a little bit so you can see a little bit better. I'm just gonna apply some pattern with black. Now the bottom left and bottom right, you'll see lots of little tiny dots. I'm gonna do that last year after I get these bigger patterns sort of placed in. Yeah, Cause it'll probably bleed out quite a bit since that brown is still wet. So I'll just place a few little dots with the tip of my brush on both the left and right side. <clears throat> and with whatever black is still in my brush, I'm going to outline the bottom of the feather and outline the upper or the, sorry, the very left side of the shaft and I might add a few of those wispy hairs. If the hairs go on a little too dark, you can always place your brush in the water for just a second, just to sort of make them a bit more subtle. You can see that's starting to look a bit more like my finished piece here with the black on there and the other colors. And that is probably good enough for the second layer. It's one of those things you could always keep fussing and fussing, but we're gonna try not to do that today. All right, so let's move to the second layer of the Scarlet Ibis. We're also gonna be scribble scrabbling here. All right, so I'm gonna work on just the left side to start. I am going to use the red orange, put some on my brush, and I'm going to place it just along the left of the shaft to start, but I'm going to kind of do it in a scribbling motion. A little bit different than how we did it um, in the last few steps where we're trying to do like a nice straight line. I'm just sort of scribbling it on and I'll kind of turn my stroke sideways sort of at an angle. And then I'll do that little hatching stroke. If you're having a hard time getting the paint to be fluid, you can just sort of place your brush in the water for a second and give yourself a little bit extra water to work with. And that can, that'll help it sort of move and push around. So I'll repeat that to the right side if that was a little fast. So just taking some red orange and I'm just sort of scribbling it along the right of the shaft. My paint is starting to dry, so it's really thickened up here, but that's not a problem. What I can do is just place my brush in the water for a second, and then I can that gives me more uh, water to work with that I can then use that wispy hatching stroke to sort of push that color out. Create kind of a loose textured look, <clears throat> and then I'll use that pink that's still on my brush to place some of those 
little wispy hairs on each side of the quill. And add a little bit to your quill as well. And then I'm gonna take just a little bit more black and apply that along the bottom edge of the quill and the left side of the quill. And the shaft, the left side of the shaft here. All right, so that is the second layer for the Scarlet Ibis feather. And now it's really just time for final adjustments. So to the wild turkey feather, um, I think it looks just a little flat in order just to add a little more dimension. I like to add just a little bit more black to some of the stripes, not to all of the stripes. Usually what I'll do is I'll just maybe do the stripes on the la last, little, I cannot speak, the stripes on the left half of the feather, I might only do the right half of those stripes. So left half of feather, but just the right half of those stripes, the part that touches the shaft. So I might just go back through and just add a little bit to the right half on the left side. And that will create a little bit of depth and make it look like the feather has a shadowed side or is even turned in just a little. You can apply a little bit right on the right side of the shaft if you wanted to. I mean, there's really no wrong answer here, but I think just adding a little bit more black, at least to some of the stripes, just gives a little more depth. I'll probably add a little bit to the very top too. <clears throat> and you could even repeat this a third time if you wanted. But you can see that just adds a little more oomph, if you will. And I might add just a touch more to the quill as well. I could fuss with that more, but since we're running out of time, I'm gonna go ahead and move to the last layer of the hawk. So what I'm gonna to do to finish up the hawk feather is I'm really just gonna add more black. So I'm gonna add more black to um, the black details on the feather, just go over each part a little bit more a second time. And I'm gonna place more uh, tiny little black dots on the very bottom left and very bottom right. Now, some of my paint is still wet, so ideally it would be nice to wait for that to dry before you go back in with the third layer, but um, we don't have that time today to wait for it to dry. So I'm just going wet over wet, but um, this, like for this, for instance, this spot here will look a lot better if you wait for it to dry and then go over it with black. It'll have more, more depth to it. And if you want, you can always add more of the other colors, but for me, the last step is more just adding a little more black just to add a bit more detail to the, the black spots on this feather. And I'll also go over that V shape that we did with the gray. I'll just kind of lightly hatch black over that and maybe a little bit along the top to some of those gray hatching strokes that kind of helps them stand out a little bit better. And then it looks a lot more like the finished one just with those final details with black. You can always add more black to the quill as well if you want. All right, I'll turn things around. To finish up the Scarlet Ibis, we'll just use the dark red. So if I hold up my finished piece here, I am going to apply dark red just sort of along the middle right of the left side where I'm kind of running my brush in a circle here. We'll use that same sort of loose scribble stroke and we can hatch some of them out. And then on the right side of the feather, I will go ahead and apply it to pretty much the whole side of the right side, the whole left side of the right side, and then hatch some of it out. <clears throat> so I'll start with the middle of the left. I'll just sort of scribble it on just like I did with the red orange. And if you need to have more fluidity, you can kind of place your brush in the water and then I'll just sort of hatch it out a little. And then I'll do the same on the right side. I'll just sort of scribble that on along the right side. I think the pink one is a really fun one to paint. It's just so kind of loose and fun. And then you kind of hatch it out with those strokes. And then you can always add 
uh, more of either of these colors a, a fourth time if you wanted, but I think that looks pretty good. It looks pretty well like the initial one I started with. So um, that's, that's the color. So I guess I should show you what's coming up, right, Tim? You guys want to see my coming classes and then I'm going to ask everybody wants to see that. All right. I can I can accommodate that request and then I want to see your guys' feathers, at least what you were able to do with me today. And as you're digging those out, I'm going to let everybody know if anybody wants to save the chat right now, now would be a good time. If you go on the chat section where the three little dots are, click on that and you can hit save chat. So that'll get anything that we talked about in the chat box on your computer safe to go back and reference it. All right. So a week from today, because you guys are stuck with me this month, I'm teaching every <laughs> Tuesday. So a week from today, I will be doing this at Bird's Nest. Okay, so I have to stress, um, if you do not have art masking fluid, please buy some this week. It is crucial to this technique. Um, a white crayon or a wax crayon is just not going to work uh, for this particular project. Uh, it, you really do need masking fluid. So it's crucial to the bird nest. So I'm really excited about this class. I hope you'll be there. And the outline for this is really easy. It's just a circle and then the three eggs. So we'll be able to get dive right into color mixing and, and painting. Okay, two weeks from today will be these blue tips in a birdhouse, which I'm really excited about too. I'll teach you guys um, some techniques to wood grain and then these sweet, cute little songbirds. This one um, will have to move at a pretty brisk pace to get it in in the hours. So I just heartily recommend you do the outline before the class. All right, so you don't go into painting already feeling overwhelmed. And then three weeks from today. Now this is a unique class. Um, this is what they call a premium online class. So yes. yeah, so there is a $20 fee. I believe that's the cost associated with it. This is, it's gonna be a much smaller class and it will be an hour and a half long. Um, but I just wanna be upfront about that. Um, these two are free online national classes, just like this one. Um, so you don't have to pay to take them. And then this one will have that $20 fee associated with it. So, so everybody knows, so that class there, the premium class is limited to the first 100 people that sign up. It's gonna be 90 minutes long. And we're gonna to look to, as we have the extra time there, we're gonna hopefully look to do a little more engagement between Mandy and myself with the, the audience that's there. If there's any questions, we're gonna be able to talk to you and have maybe myself or uh, Mandy answer those like live right there for you as well. And here's one note on that class, if you don't know about it, is that if you do not take this class, the video replay is not available for that. So you must sign up and pay for that class in order to review that class to come join us and also to watch the replay. Okay, so I'm really excited to make up this hour without me losing power. Yay. Okay, so uh, it's three o'clock on the button. If you guys were able to paint along with me, I need to switch my camera to gallery view so I can see your feathers. Uh, so hold them up if you will. Woo! I'm always so impressed. I, I think I say the same thing every class. It, it blows me away. Wow. Amazing. I have to say so, that too. Oh, wow. That's amazing. So many of you painted along with me today. This is incredible. Okay, so please be sure to... Um, I only see little thumbnail images of these paintings. So take me up on it. I always say, please email me pictures of your art so I can see a bigger picture of it. And I always do my best to respond. Um, every once in a while I may miss one, but it's not intentional. Um, or you can tag me on social media and that way I can see them that way. So my handle across all social media is Mandy Peltier Artist. Or you can go on my website, mandypeltier.com and see links to social media. So, but I'm so impressed. You all did an amazing, amazing job. Great job, everyone. Yeah, job. Th thanks for spending this hour with me and I hope to see you over the next three weeks. <laughs>